<laughs> All right. <coughs> I'm sitting in the video. Oh, God, yeah. My mic's live, isn't it? <laughs> I just realized. <laughs> Interesting. Good I didn't swear. Hello there and welcome to Love Audio's YouTube channel. My name is Paul Weber. Very good to be on the channel tonight and glad to have you along as well this evening, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you happen to be listening around the world. Uh, do let me know in the comments, especially if you are new here. Uh, and if you are new here, make sure you let us know that. And uh, if you've been around for a while and you're used to this stream, make sure you make the newcomers feel very welcome indeed. All right. So what is Love Audio production all about? It's a safe, fun friendly and hopefully entertaining platform for you to learn the basics in audio production. So if you're on board with that, let's get cracking, shall we? All right then, um, very special stream tonight. Let's say hi to some few, uh, few people first of all. Rich Vibes is in from Exeter. Hello, Rich, good to see you. Uh, also hi to uh, Tom and Becky, both watch watching on the big TV screen tonight. That's the best way to do it. And make sure the stereo is cranked right up, which is really cool. Um, so thanks indeed for that, Tom and Becky. Glad to know that you're both watching tonight. If you are in the comments, you want to say hi, ask us any questions, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, I've got a very special guest with me tonight, and um, I'm going to read his introduction out to you from this particular biog, because I don't want to get it wrong, okay? Now, my guest is a world-renowned mastering engineer with over 30 years experience in all aspects of mastering audio for vinyl, CD, DVD, HD audio, and digital, digital downloads. Now, following nearly three decades of mastering experience at the legendary The Exchange Mastering Studios in London, working on all genres of music at an international level, relocating and opening the studio that he has built in Devon was the logical next step in continuing to make great music sound better. Now, being totally tuned to the acoustic environment in the Exchange Studio 2, the most important consideration was to recreate this in his brand new facility in East Devon. And he's gone to great lengths to ensure that the listening experience in his new mastering studio is identical to the one he left behind. And I've been there and I, I, I know the setup and it's really, really good. Um, Mike spent 28 years mastering at The Exchange in London, beginning with its creation in 1986, actively involved in the technical construction of the studios before they went on air. Now, on leaving school in 84, uh, this particular gentleman started his career recording engineer in West Country Studio, learning the hard way uh, using a one-inch multi-track tape machine, uh, slinging the bits that he edited over his shoulder, no doubt, with some China Graph pencils and, and things like that, and razor blades and whatever else. Um, and then, uh, you know, no Pro Tools in those days, no hard disks, no samplers, no automation back in the day, but also a 24-track digital mixing desk or, or analog mixing desk as it was back in the day. Now, two and a half years of his life has been spent tearing his hair out, controlling numerous uh, reprobates who made it up as they went along. A bit like me, really. Which would be quite interesting. Um, he started a new life at the Exchange and quickly settled on mastering as his knob-twiddling job of choice. Um, establishing himself as an in-demand engineer with artists, producers and record companies alike, uh, this particular chap began to carve a niche for himself, turning his hand and ears to the many now legendary albums and singles of the day. Now that includes things like Stereo MCs, Connected, Bjork, Debut, Massive Attack, Protection, amongst many, many others. And not wanting to pigeonhole himself in any particular mu music genre, he became respected for his mustering work on rock, 
pop, dance music, all sorts of things, and includes the likes of the Chemical Brothers, Basement Jacks, Oasis, Prodigy, Jamiroquai, Depeche Mode, Calvin Harris, Jonas Blue, Zed, Kasabian, and The Darkness, just to name a few of those artists that he's worked with. Ladies and gentlemen, please will you put your hands together and welcome to the show the one and only Mike Marsh. <laughs> wait, wait. I've got to mute him first. Hang on a minute. There he is. Hang on a second. <laughs> I thought I was coming on the Love Audio stream, not This Is Your Life. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> it, it's, I had to do it all, and I'm glad I did. So, uh, Mike Marsh, welcome you to read the show. It very How well. are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, great to be here. And hello, streamers yeah, on the big TVs. Guys. Uh, they're going to love it tonight. We're going to be talking about, um, you know, what is mastering? So we'll begin there, in fact. So going back to, to your early days at the, at the exchange, uh, were, you, were you interested in mastering? Is it something you learned as you went along? How, do, how, do, how, do you, how would you describe your journey there? Um, a bit like the story of my life, really. I was in the right place at the right time. So as you said, I started off in a small recording studio in Devon, which is where we're all at now, mm. um, as a school kid, basically. And I didn't know anything about it, but I wanted to get into engineering and music because I was a, a massive music fan. Um, so I got into that studio on a YTS course um, where the guy literally just took me on and trained me on the spot that was the only way you could learn you literally were thrown in at the deep end with all the buttons knobs faders and everything and you're like okay where do we start and very quickly you learn what you got to do and also control like a whole bunch of guys who are in a band who are probably also as as kind of nervous and and untogether as you are anyway long story short i worked there for two and a half years um and I really loved it, but I got sent to London on a mission to go and deliver something, I think, to a mastering studio in London. And then I had a look in and, and saw what was going on and thought, oh, OK, I quite like this. This looks mm -hmm. interesting. It's different. It's very different than recording. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a solitary job. But I liked the idea of it. And one of the things that was not getting me down at the studio, but one thing I found really annoying was that you'd be in a recording session with the band and they hadn't got the faintest, I faintest idea what they were going to do next. Sorry, there goes an email. Need to turn that off somehow. I don't know which button to press. We, um, we, we didn't so, hear it, so you're, you're all good. Carry on. Oh, good. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so um, you can see I'm making it up as I go along here as well and I've got no buttons to press. So Exactly. Um, yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so I... I had my eyes opened into mastering, if you like, and I liked what I saw. Mm. Now, the guy, the, the, the studio that I went to in London, I was working for his brother at the recording studio in Devon. So that was the kind of easy foot in the door connection. And um, these guys used to run the cutting studio I went to, or the mastering studio, was based at Island Records okay. uh, Music in West London. And I think when I popped in, they were working on some Bob Marley stuff, you know, so it was like, whoa, okay. Um, home to Grace Jones, you know, um, or U2, all of these kind of legendary artists. Yeah. And I, I drove back from me doing this delivery or whatever it was. I drove back to London thinking, I want to do that. Anyhow, six months later, these guys running the studio in London um, were looking to set their own new studio up because the record company didn't want to invest in any more equipment. Mm -hmm. CDs were on the brink of coming out, and it was a big expenditure for a lot of studios. Yeah. So um, these guys decided to jump ship and set their own place up. They called the brother up in, in Devon and said, do you think Mike would – mind coming up to just help us build the studio really it wasn't a job offer it was like go up and and put the gear together and get it all on you know get it on the air and get it working wow. and they said well come up for a month or something like that you know mm. i was like 19 you know bright lights big city still living at home with the parents so yeah this was like you don't you don't turn that opportunity down so I did it thinking I'm only going to be up here for a month, but I'll have fun. Mm -hmm. And essentially, I never came back. I was there for 28 years. I didn't wow. come back to Devon. That's so an incredible they story. actually said to me, yeah, 
So sorry, sorry, you you butt in when I'm going on too much because I'm no, a no, bit no, of a it's, it's fine. And, but you were involved at the at the ground <laughs> roots, and you were there to to kind of you know really set it up, and and that's why. Yeah. If you don't mind me saying, that's why you you wanted to replicate exactly the sound that you created for that studio in your own studio Absolutely in that. East Devon now, yeah. Yeah, well, because I was so hands-on building it, and we're talking like proper soldering iron action mm. up till goodness knows what hours of the day and night with leads flying everywhere, um, multimeter, test meters, so you're checking continuity and earths and all this kind of stuff. I loved all of that construction side of it, but to have that, um, to have that feeling of being, like this might sound a bit weird, but being at one with your equipment because mm. you've built it, and you know it inside out, you know every connector, every plug, every lead, that just gives you a heck of a lot of confidence to walk into that studio and know what you're doing. You know, even though mastering was a new job for me, because I had the kind of the, the technical um, stability in my mind, if you like, I felt, mm. well, I can do this because I know where the gear works. You know, and that's half um, the battle, yeah. isn't it? You know, we, we buy new gear all the time. Um, I showed you my mixing desk earlier on, and, and that's a fairly new acquisition. But getting getting your head around it is another matter, isn't it? And you know, no, none of us reads manuals, do they? But a lot of it is self taught, isn't it, Mike? So you know, you, you you get the gear, you go right, okay, I know what that does, but how do I tweak it so it's how I want it to sound? And and that's that's half the battle of, and half the fun, really, of getting to know your gear. Yeah, I mean, even more so now because everything's so digital audio workstation based and computer based. You know, mm. back in the day when I started, it was a very physical hands on process. It was all about tape machines and winding a reel onto a tape machine. And as you said, editing with razor blades and China graph pencils and stuff. So yeah. it was it was it was dirty work. You know, you had to get your hands in and, and do it, whereas now you're just waving a mouse across the screen. But the most frustrating thing is is when you've got a session that you're doing and there's pressure to turn it round, mm. and you've got a new bit of software running that you don't know how to drive yet. Uh -huh. um, and you you end up, you know, waste time. Uh, and if you've got a room full of people, they might be huffing and puffing going, well, who's this guy? I thought, you know, he thought he knew what he was doing. <laughs> yeah. um, so there is that issue. I don't like um, having to learn new toys on the computer. I do it because you have to keep up to date. Sure. But I try and do that on my days off so that I'm not spent time, I'm, I'm not learning on the job. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I've I like to go into work and hit the ground running. Well, that's right, yeah. And, and, Sorry. and you know, I've, I've visited your studio and um, you, you happened to be playing, or you played me uh, an example of um, Giants, the single you worked on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with, um, and it Rangel was out Man. when you heard it, by the way. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly that's right. Calvin that Harrison, was, abso Rangel that was absolutely Man. amazing. And and you know, a lot of the gear that you were using would be what we call outboard gear. Totally, yeah, yeah. and old school outboard gear as well. Right, but but you've you've managed, and and this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you: How over the years have you managed to to tweak the sound to bring that magic that Mike Marsh delivers to the the songs that you master? How how have you managed to kind of you know, hone that, if you will, hone that skill? Gosh, um, mastering, like sound engineering, is a very, very personal thing. Mm -hmm. And that's why I guess artists choose a guy to work with because they like the sound he gets. Yep. But if I'm being honest with you, and I say this to all the artists that I work with, I'm not actually working on their music to make them, to make it sound good for them. I'm trying to get it to sound good for me. I okay. know what I think... I want it to sound like so mm -hmm. um and when you do what i do you really have to like um have faith in yourself and really take control of what's been put in front of you you can't you can't sit there and should i do that or oh maybe i've done a bit too much mm -hmm. you have to go with your gut feeling and, and i guess in mastering you get that gut feeling really quickly um having listened to so many records or bits of music over the last 30 years you can, I can tell, like, probably within about 10 seconds, sure. what's good or what's bad about it. Obviously, I've got to have deep listens, you know, but let's say you're working on a three minute track within 10 seconds, and it might just be intro drums, like, a, you know, say you've got a dance track, you'll have a drum loop on the front, yeah. straight away, I'll know what's wrong with it, or what's right with it, you know, wow. and sometimes I'm 
I'm pleasantly surprised. And sometimes within 10 seconds, I'm going, okay, my work's cut out here. <laughs> but you get in and you do what you've got to do. And I love that. Um, we've got some, some comments coming in. Uh, Rob Thomas is in from uh, the, the United States. Um, says, hello, Paul and Mike. Um, hey, Rob. Rob's dad is a keen uh, radio ham, or at least was in, in the past, and, and uh, has got a lot of old school gear in his garage. I, I, Rob, I hope you don't mind me saying that. And I mentioned to him that you were a bit of a, a radio ham yourself. So where does that figure into the, into the whole kind of tech thing? Have you always been into kind of, um, you know, uh, amateur radio, as it were? Yeah, I started that as a teenager. Um, I got into, back in the day when I was about 14 or 15, I got into CB radio, mm. uh, as a lot of teenagers did back then. You know, we didn't have mobile phones or PlayStations and stuff like that. It was CB radio or your turntable. So, sure. Um, and yeah, I love my geeky electronics. I love building things, aerials, you know, and it was more, it was a case of leads going everywhere and learning how to get a transmitter to work and and talk to people, you know. Yeah. Um, so I've now got an am a radio ham license or an amateur radio license as well, and that lets me communicate around the world, you know. So, yeah, it's great fun. Are we allowed to ask what your handle is? I don't have a handle. Oh. It's a call sign. Oh, and call it's, sign. Uh, okay. Yeah, and it's uh, it's uh, issued by Ofcom as well. Oh, so okay. I'm like my own little radio station in my own right, really. Sure. Uh, so oh, my call sign... We don't have to say it if you don't want to. It's entirely up to you. It's fine. It's probably all over. It's all over all the, you know, the search engines anyway. But it's uh, call sign is G1IAR. Or if you want to be technical, Golf 1, India, Alpha, Romeo. Wow. In phonetics. And um, I've had that since I was 17. That's, that's incredible. Uh, Rob says, um, and he's, he's, he says, I love audio production, says garage. A new word to add to our <laughs> translation book because they, because they call it a garage, we call it yeah. a garage, don't we? Over a here. garage, yeah. Garage, yeah. yeah. I think Not... you should have put a D in there. G A W -R, R I D G E. <laughs> oh, uh. I love it. <clears throat> um, listen, we'll give you a quick look at your um, uh, your your website, if we may, and you've got you've got your biog there, which is fantastic, and and I've read some of that out as you as you probably heard on the intro, which is cool. But you also have. Um, for anybody to see at, at mikemarshmastering.co.uk is Mike's website, by the way. You can check that out anytime you like. Um, but you've got your discography. And I was just scrolling through some of the songs on here. They're just incredible. And, and this stretches from, uh, let me just go to the top and, and I can just whiz through some of them. So we're talking about 1988 and things like the special AKA, Free Nelson Mandela, great song on Chrysalis. And you were responsible for, for yeah. mastering the 12-inch single of that. Yeah. And Just I had quite a hard amazing. job with that track, actually. I remember that. It was um, I kept, my memory, right? If you ask me what I did yesterday, I can't remember. <laughs> but if you ask me what I did 30 years ago, it's like photographic. Wow. And I had awful trouble with this. Um, you know the word sibilance? It's a love audio term, um, audio yes. production. So sibilance is when somebody's voice is really essy. Yeah. Um, and I was cutting a 12-inch single, as you see there. Yeah. And um, I had real big issues with that track. If you think of the chorus, free, I'm not going to sing it, free, 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 free Nelson. Free, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There you do it. No. There you go. <laughs> free, free, free Nelson Mandela. That one, yeah. That's it. Kind but the thing. opening line as well, 25 years in captivity yeah, um, was how it started. Yeah. So um, Jerry Dammers, who actually wrote that track, was with me at the time when we cut it. And he had to write the lyric out for me. Um, so that I could follow it while I was cutting the record, and I was making these minuscule adjustments wow. um, to the to the DSA to so that it wouldn't catch all of the track. I only wanted it to catch like captivity yeah. and just Nelson when it peaked on the and T's all of that. and the S's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now okay. you've got gear that does that automatically, but sometimes it was doing too much on the other things that I didn't want it to do it on. So I was manually riding it while we were cutting. Wow. And of course, if I cocked it up, I'd have to start again. Yeah, because, uh, because once you start cutting a record, I was, I, I was going to explain. I was going to explain that. So, so yeah, let, just talk through the actual cutting process. You get this acetate, this black sheet of of um, acetate that the and and you'll describe it better than I can, I'm sure. But when I was there, my my thoughts behind it were: you send audio signal to this massive machine thing, and it carves out the track as you as you go across the acetate is that kind of how it works just just if, if you will totally, for, for yeah. the viewers just describe that for us if you will yeah of course 
Yeah. Um, so when you cut a record, um, you you do you start off with a larger than a, a record size. You start off with a fourteen inch um, black lacquer disc, and it looks like a mirror. If you look at it, you know you you see it's totally unblemished, it, and the reflection from it is is huge. So mm. that goes onto the disc cutting lathe. Okay, which you then spin up to the right speed at which you're going to cut the record at 33 or 45. We don't do 78 really anymore now. Okay. Um, so um, you, you set the lathe to the right speed. That disc goes on the turntable, which is a big heavy platter. Yep. And then uh, effectively you, you, you play your tape or you play your music through my desk. It then goes to that big, huge, crazy, humongous looking machine thing, um, <laughs> which has a, a little box on it and, and a little needle poking down like this underneath. Sure. And as the disc is spinning round, that cutter head um, has dropped onto the blank lacquer yeah. and it's cutting a groove. And that, that, like, um, that, that wavy line that it's cutting that's thinner than a human hair yeah. contains all the music and all the information. And it gets thrown about um the groove is moving like this the whole time and up and down it's very very much like if the best thing i can describe it is is you know in like winter olympics they do the bobsleigh yeah so you've got that toboggan going down that track which mm. is, looks incredibly how how do they even stay in there that is exactly what it's like for a stylus to play to be played in a record that's what it would look like if you cross sectioned a groove which is a yeah. v-shape like this yep then then it would be doing all of this and how on earth i'm i'm still amazed when i cut a record now i'm still amazed a how good they sound but b how the bloody hell does it work i know well i mean i know how it works but well you know how it works now of course and you were saying to me that that's that that groove is continuous there's no you know when you look at a record it looks yeah. like it's broken doesn't it but it's one whole yeah it's one whole groove. That's the trick question. It's like, yeah. uh, you know, somebody might ask you, how many grooves are there on a record? Uh, and people will go, oh, I don't know, hundreds. But it, that's wrong. That'll <laughs> be a who wants to be a millionaire question. You know this. There's only one groove on a record because when you start yeah. at the running groove, yep. yeah, um, you the music then, even with the gaps as well, even mm -hmm. when, when you've got like on an LP where you put it across – the, the groove is still there. There's just no yeah. music in it, so it it's silent. But well, um, and, it, and you can see a gap on the record because the stylus, when you play the record back, you can see it move even in that gap. You can that talk about on an album. And the shorter yeah. the record, yeah. the quicker you'll see it move. Yeah. Ah, right. So okay. a five minute, twelve inch, you're literally yeah. going to be able to watch. You'll be able to watch that that you know the needle yeah. going across your record. But with an album, which is cramming in twenty plus minutes per side. Yeah, it's moving quite slowly. Yeah, incredible. Um, Rob Thomas says um, that is awesome. Thanks for sharing your ham radio experience. So um, he's very pleased. Did you You're see welcome. His, his hand? His dad's handle say... came up, which is W eight J H L. Okay, w... Whiskey Eight Juliet Hotel Lima. Yeah, there you go. Phonetic alphabet helps, doesn't it? I'll say seven three. It means nothing to me, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it will do to Rob. Uh, Rich Vibe says, oh, he did Young MC, Know How. Love that track. Brilliant. Um, who else we got here? So uh, speaking of record making, uh, Rob says, my dad used to make his own records at home. We have two boxes of 79 records uh, that he recorded way back in the 40s and 50s. Wow. 79 wow, or 78? That... Or whether it's 79, 79 number. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Um, Two boxes of 78 records, probably. You're right, yeah. So seven, 78 is the speed, I think, Rob, that you're talking about. But um, that's, that's an amazing fact. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for posting that. That's brilliant. Um, going back to the discography, obviously, we, we've, we're touching on the 80s and 90s and things like that. Depeche Mode, one of my favourite artists. I know you've worked a lot with them. And you've also done some recent stuff with them, haven't you? Yeah, well, um, the, the, the last big th project I did for them was like um, a complete remastering of... Uh, of every one of their singles wow. um including all of the like the remixes you know they they put a single out mm. which would go to radio but there might be two or three other tracks packaged with that single and then yeah. 20 remixes so um they were always very very generous to the fans mm. um 
and they released lots of formats as well. So it was good for good for sales, I guess, back when records sold quite well. Um, but you know, Depeche Mode have got a hardcore group of fans as well. So yeah. whenever they were releasing lots of stuff, the fans went and bought everything. You know, uh, but it it was a proper journey. You know, I mean, I was working on tracks. Uh, like, for example, Jess Can't Get Enough. Mm. I put the master tape of that on, which actually was in quite a bit of a state physically. Sure. Um, it was falling apart. Um, but I put that record, up, that tape on, and I thought, this is like 1981. I was still at school. Yeah. And here I am playing one of the tracks that I was probably dancing to at the school disco, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it, it it was quite a surreal moment for me, you know. Um, I, but I was, so uh, over the years, I've done a lot. I was lucky enough to see them in concert in Plymouth. Just a, wow. an amazing concert. So yeah, really. Right. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those things I will treasure, and and I've always been a massive fan of it. Um, I was I was in a synth band at school. Funny enough, late later years at school, and um, and we did Depeche Mode, Human League covers. We did wow. Simple Mind stuff. Yeah, uh, okay. Thompson Twins, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. you know, it was just it was a great time to to be around. Great music at that time. It was. I love the it fact was. That you, yeah, I love the fact that you've done some uh, uh, some work with them, especially recently, and and uh, you know re re not rehashing, but you know reviving, if you will, some of those yeah. classic hits. Yeah, well, there were, and there were also you know with, with that particular job, there were actually also mixes that had never been released before mm. or never been heard. You know, so sure. that was the kind of that was the the draw, I suppose, for the fan base. You know, yeah. um, and it's always fun doing that sort of thing. And I remember t talking about that era. I remember um, uh, I did. I've done two albums for the Human League. Okay. Um, and when I was revising for my O levels at school, um, I you, you must remember the Dare album. I mean, it's like yeah, probably one stunning. of the best albums. Yeah. You know, absolutely. And stunning. Um, I was I was doing. Um, I think the, the first album I did for them was called Secrets, uh, and then the recent one, which is called Credo. Um, they only release something like every 10 years. So recent might be quite a few years back now. <laughs> but I remember Phil Oakey came in and who's like, you know, the nicest guy. Mm. And I said to him, I, once we got going and, and we had time to chat and stuff like that, I said, this is quite surreal for me to meet you. You know, I don't normally get that kind of thing. But I said, I grew up listening to your music. And I told yeah. him the story about um, revising to my O-levels with Dare. Basically, I was playing the A side, then the B side. It was on loop, and he 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 did question whether I passed any exams <laughs> <laughs> because of yeah. it. But yeah, more, more interested in the yeah. in the songs on on the album Dare than than uh, getting any studies done. Yeah, that's great. Basically, yeah, yeah, that's superb. Uh, yeah, so if you've got any comments, by the way, please do drop them in into the uh, the chat, and we'll make sure that we get them answered for you. I'm just going through some of the other discography um, listings. I mean, it just goes on and on, Mike. You've done so much work over the past what would you say thirty thirty five years? Yeah, well, I'm an old git now, aren't I? I've been, <laughs> uh, been doing it since 19, 1988, mastering. And wow. it's scary when I look back and I think, gosh, that's that is like 34 years now. But it doesn't feel like it. I mean, no. I can remember stuff from, you know, I can remember being in the studio in the late 80s when all this stuff was kicking off and new genres being invented. I can remember it like yesterday, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I still have very, very vivid memories, pretty much of everything I've worked on, sometimes to the level where I can remember what my EQ settings were, you know, which is ultra geeky. But those are the, you know, when, when you're passionate about what you do, those are yeah. the things, they're about the only things I can remember. I can't, you know, I can't remember what's on the shopping list. I can't remember what I've just gone upstairs for or walked into the kitchen for, but I can remember stuff like that. Um what was what was pleasing for me when I came to to visit you in your studios was the fact that you you had some um, you very often get sent uh, gold discs and and uh, you know memorabilia like that don't you from the artist which is a which is an amazing gift isn't it and and you you showed me one from I believe it was the Prodigy and also the Chemical Brothers you've done a lot of work with them just talk us through how how your relationship with the Chemical Brothers kind of started and and where you are now with them. Gosh, um, yeah. Well, um, in in a in a sentence, they're my my longest running, most loyal client. Um, I've done everything that, that that they've ever released. In fact, we kind of started working together before they were the Chemical Brothers. Initially, they were called the Dust Brothers, uh, but they had to change their name for legal reasons because there was a 
an artist in America that was using the same name. So the Chemical Brothers, they gave way and budged and became the Chemical Brothers. Um, and yeah, we started doing stuff like um, about 92, 93, something like that. So, and, and we've been working together ever since. And bless them, they're the two, they're, you know, two of the nicest guys. And if live show, we, I would take my son along. It's, it's traditional for me to get to a Chemical Brothers gig once a year somewhere. Brilliant. Last year didn't happen because of COVID, but you know. Um, so yeah, they're, and Tom, Tom and Ed from the Chemicals, they, they kind of joke and they say, you're the third Chemical Brother, Mike, you know, so oh, it's, oh, it's just really nice. That is so nice to hear, isn't it? Because, you know, what, once, yeah. you've, once you've done your work on, on their project, because don't forget, the thing is, we've got to, what we've got to realise is that they are the artists, they've, yeah. they've recorded it in a studio, they've produced it or had a producer produce it for them. They then send it to the mastering engineer, which is yourself, and you're putting that polish on it, as I, we mentioned earlier on, your, your, your certain... Final touch, yeah. Yeah, exactly, your final touch. And, and so it's really nice when they recognise your ability to be able to, to help them finish off their project and get it out to the masses. It's just, it's just so humbling. It must be. It must be really nice. Uh, it, it is, yeah. yeah. And, you know, the, the biggest compliment that you have is that somebody comes back to do another job with you. Yeah. That's that basically means, yeah, sure, they were happy because they're coming back. They wouldn't, you know, if they were unhappy, they'd go somewhere else. So, mm -hmm. um, and I say this to, to Tom and Ed from The Chemicals, you know, they, they could go anywhere in the world and work with, with anybody they, they wanted to over all these years. And they'd say, well, why would we want to do that? You know, we've got the team together. And, and, and I guess you build up a, a, a real understanding of each other as well. And, and everybody knows what's expected of each other as well, you know, mm -hmm. although like I do with everybody with their stuff. If, if the mixes need a lot of help and a lot of um, processing at my end, I'll get in and do it. You know, sure. um, I don't just go, oh, they're a big artist. Um, I better not touch it too much, you know, because in a way that's the worst thing I could do. Well, um, you really I mean, and, and if you do that, there. of course, what you're going to get then is that, you know, you'll get half a dozen things coming back to you going, well, it's not enough. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. You've so got you to, wanna... like, yeah, you want to, you, you have to go the extra into... mile on every job. Yeah. And, and the way I approach work now is that every, every day I go into, I don't go into work every day, but every day I'm working is like a new day at work. Mm. And whatever you're working on is the most important piece of music for that day. You know, whoever they are, whether it's a busker on the street or a Grammy award winning artist, you know, it really um, is. A, got a question in from Tom says, uh, what would you say is the most difficult thing about mastering or mixing in general? What would you say is the most difficult thing? Um, well, mixing and mastering are very different. Yeah. So the most difficult thing about mixing would be getting a good balance between all the elements mm -hmm. so that something doesn't sound cluttered. Okay. Um, so you've got plenty sometimes of when people, headroom, if you will. So the headroom is... Not necessarily headroom. Okay. Um, yeah, you're talking about a volume thing. So, right. so yeah, don't don't cry to the max so that everything's fighting. Sure. But I'm talking about engineering that, like, sonic space between the speakers using pan pots um, and, and positioning things in that stereo picture. Okay. Um, as well as making sure that, like, the tones and the EQs of everything that you've got going on in a mix mm. have good separation so you can pick stuff out. For example, if you've got the worst, the hardest area to work on is, is the, the bottom end or the bass end. If you've got bass drums, bass guitars, bass synths that are all rumbling around in the same area, then forget it. You're not going to have any clarity or punch down that end, you know? So mm. that'll be the hardest thing to get right in any, anybody's mix. There you go. That, that, that's the one liner for mixing <clears throat> hardest thing to get right for mastering i don't know yeah. um uh, tom tom um has started producing his own drum and bass music okay um from home currently obviously um as we're in lockdown and everything else and um really likes uh to come up with his own ideas and things like that so from his standpoint he's mixing that in the in the box as we call it not out of the box but you know yeah on, on a daw digital audio workstation so um so he's doing the kind of mixing thing but he's also very conscious and very aware of that headroom we spoke about just now so doesn't want to fill it with tons of stuff so that you're peaking at the far end when you come to your master channel 
Um, and then, and then, obviously, once Tom's done his drum and bass mix, if he was in the professional realm, he would then what send it to a, a, a mixing engineer? Sorry, mastering engineer like yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And then what we would do is, yep. even if his mix was low in level, mm -hmm. um, we we would bring it up to what's expected in the outside world these days, which is very loud. Um, <laughs> there is no quiet anymore now, unfortunately. No. You know, dynamic range is something that only old people like myself <laughs> remember. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't matter. When somebody sends a master for me mm -hmm. to work on, or a pre-master as it's called now, yeah. uh, to work on, it doesn't matter if the level's low, we can easily make up the gain. It doesn't necessarily matter if the mix is a little bit jumpy in terms of levels. We've got compressors, we've got stuff that can deal with that. What is key, mix even eventually sounding good, is that clarity between the elements. If you don't have that separation, it's just going to be a mush, and that's hard to get right. You really need to know your your monitors inside out, and mm -hmm. if you're mixing on headphones, that makes it ten times harder to get the um, the bottom end right as well, because um, well, headphones are better than they used to be, but they're not the best for yeah. I mean, the, for being believe it or not, these end. these were these were twenty quid, twenty UK pounds, okay. right? And I've got a set in the booth as well, the voiceover booth behind these shelves, and to me, they are the truest sound I've ever experienced in any headphones I've ever bought. I've bought Sennheisers for $150 or, you know, pounds, whatever it is. I've bought this, that, and the other. And these are by far better than those. Okay. For clarity. Well, so it's really odd, isn't it? They're the cheapest pair of headphones you can get. They're, they're not kind of closed back or anything like that. They're just cheap, you know, cheap entry level DJ headphones. But the sound they produce. Is, they're is, Fisher Price ones that you got from a Christmas cracker, right? Pretty much. Well, they're, they're made by a brand called Yoga. <laughs> I mean, who knew? Okay. And it used to be at a. The thing is, what you've done is. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You've just hit on on one of the key points of audio engineering here, sure. is that if you are familiar with the bit of kit that you're using and you understand what you're hearing, mm. then you can work um, quite happily on that because you know what's good about them you know what's bad about them yeah. what's right and what's wrong so the key to getting good at mixing records in your own room in your bedroom in your garage wherever it is is to understand what you're listening to in that environment and if you if you're hearing a true representation of the music in your headphones or on your monitors mm. you know and and frequency response wise that's telling the truth then you should be nailing the mixes every time yeah um but you're right. Sometimes when I when I think the mix is good in my headphones, I then listen to it on the speakers, and there's not enough bottom end. So okay. does that mean that the headphones are giving me too much bass response? And and I it sounds, sounds like great. it. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Either that or your monitors in the studio are bass light. You know, you've um, got that issue as well potentially. But yeah, I mean, I'm using uh, yeah. M I'm using M audio um, audio file speakers uh, AV forties, and I've got a sub bass from Yamaha underneath the desk. Okay, so I use that okay. if I need. Some so you should bass. be hearing it. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. But you know, and I've got it at optimum position, so it's in level with my with my ears. When I came to your studios, you had this massive tower of speakers <laughs> behind the desk, didn't you? So, and, and yeah. you're able to crank that up without without any neighbors hearing anything. So the sound quality in that room and the sound insulation in that room is just spectacular. Um, that was, I, I believe that that array of speakers was something that you built yourself. Is that correct? Uh, not quite. Uh, they were they were custom built for the studio oh, okay. um, that I used to work for in London. So mm. um, yeah, the speaker designer that made those um, built them specifically actually for the room and the shape of that room yeah. that they were in. And the, the speakers are tunable to um, to the space that they work in um, by way of um, phase cancellation and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So um, that was another key issue for me when I moved the studio from London back, back home to Devon. The reason I wanted to make it um, sound and be built in exactly the same way was that the monitors could move house and just be dropped in place and everything still sound the same. Um, coupled with that, the fact that I'd work, I've been working on these monitors for 34 years, I wouldn't trust another set of speakers. 
you know right. when you when you feel so at one with what you're hearing mm -hmm. you know I, I i feel quantified then to be able to go into work and go right that sounds good that sounds bad don't like that you know because you know what you're hearing is true yeah. so um, we're just we're just um, firing off a few photos off your website as well with regards to the um the setup, uh, Mike. Okay, so, yeah, right. I can see those. Yeah, right. Looks looks really, really good. Uh, like I say, if anybody's got any questions, drop them in the comments. We'll do our best to answer them whilst Mike's still here. We've got uh, around about mm. twenty minutes left to go of the show. But uh, interestingly, on the on the gallery there, if I just scroll back a bit, you, you can see that 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 um, uh, that lacquer cutting machine very clearly is showing how that kind of works. So you were talking about that earlier, weren't you? Um, and and yeah. That's the tape machine there, the tape path and everything, That's the tape which is machines. cool. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, you're talking cool. about the, uh, there it is. Yeah. That's and, and it's, a, it's, it's cool. Sorry, go on. There we go. It's, um, this, this machine is the Neumann VMS 70 disc cutting lathe. Wow. Um, and to, to, you know, anybody walking in, it looks like something out of Doctor Who's TARDIS. It doesn't look sexy. It doesn't look modern. But I'm telling you now that yeah. that unit was bought in was built in 1974, and you couldn't do a better job with it with today's technology to make it do a better job, any better job than it does. Wow. There is a more modern lathe than this, and it's got a computer built into it, which is supposed to help you pack the grooves in better. Okay. Um, but I hated that lathe because I'm a bit of a control freak, so I like to take control of it all myself. Yeah. You're looking at an LP cut there by the looks of it. Yeah. I can see that, yeah, because um, you can see the separation between the, I'm pointing at the screen like you can see it. Yeah. But um <laughs> what we call the spirals. The spirals, yeah, exactly. Um so I can see the it tracks, too. yeah, the tracks are separated and of course and then, and then there's gap where that goes that transitions from yeah. the end of one track to the beginning of a new track. But it's still the same yeah. the same groove. It's you know? still the same groove. The groove is there and it carries the stylus across that gap. Yeah. So basically when you cut a record, all I'm doing is I'm pressing a button, it's called the scroll button, and mm. all it does is it makes the lathe go whoop, and it just goes a little bit quicker sure. across the record for, a, you know, for like, uh, it's about half a second. You can set it to different lengths, yeah. so you can make the sizes. But yeah, every time you get, and if you forget to do that, you've buggered it up. You know, we've all been there where you've got a, a five tracks to cut on one side, mm -hmm. and then you, you, you finish the cut, brilliant, everybody's happy, and then you look at it and go, you look at it on the turntable and you're like, Oh, it only looks like four oh. tracks are on there because you've forgotten to press the scroll button yeah. to make the make the lathe go across. So you never you, you only do that mistake once. You never forget. Every time there's a gap, press the button. So so yeah. So in that instance, when the person, if you left it like it was, if the person then is is trying to locate one of those tracks with the with the stylus and the arm. Yep. Yeah. They're not going to be able yeah. to find it, are they? Because there's no gap. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. And that's the beauty with records. It's quite a visual thing, isn't it? It's it very is. physical. It's very visual. So you can literally skip across a record and go straight to the track you want. Well, you must be delighted the fact that vinyl is making a comeback and, and is really popular nowadays, um, as it was, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago. So, you know, vinyl's making a resurgence. Are you doing more in the way of vinyl pressing these days other, you know, rather than digital or, or a mixture yeah, of Yeah. Um, to be fair, it never actually really totally went away. Um, sales figures dropped off phenomenally. You know, mm -hmm. CD came along and, and almost spelt the death knell for vinyl, actually. Sure. So sales figures very slowly, slowly went down. But the thing is, when you're a disc cutting studio and you have to cut the master record, it doesn't matter to us whether that record only sells one copy or 10 million copies. Mm. I still have to cut the first blank. So even though sales figures were going down, we were still mastering as many records, if that makes sense. Um, and, and I when, guess we got to like, go on. Sorry, I was going to say, when I was there, you showed me that you, you press, like, say, for instance, the A side, and then you press the B side, obviously as a separate acetate, and then they both go together in this really sturdy box and then get sent off to the pressing plant. Is that, just talk us through that if you will. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to correct you already now. So okay. I don't press the A side ah. or press the B side. I cut, cut. the A side. Right. Okay. Thank and you. And cut the B side. There you go. <laughs> just had to correct you there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's it. Geeky, geeky um, uh, job speak, isn't it? But yeah, so um, when you do a record, you have to, you have to cut one side of the record on one disc then that gets put away. Then you get a fresh disc out for the other side of the record. So effectively, when you've bought an LP, that came from two discs originally. 
And what happens is those get boxed up in the studio. Mm -hmm. They get sent off to the pressing plant. They take one disc, they take the other disc. Yep. They turn it into a piece of metal. Um, and then they put those two bits of metal on top. It's very crude. On top of the record pressing machine. Yeah. In here goes a blob of vinyl, right? It looks like a sort of like a little squash donut. Right. And the and the pressing pl the pl the press the record press comes down like that yep. and squeezes out the vinyl. Next wow. one comes in, squish. Yep. Next one comes in, squish. So it's a very old school factory process. Wow. Um, you know it's smelly, it's noisy, all of that. How on how on earth can you then play that back at home? How does that work? Right. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, but but also, um, you know, I, I guess in, in part of that process, it's being trimmed off as well. The, you know, any excess vinyl yeah, yeah, yeah. is trimmed away. Um, as we mentioned earlier, when I'm cutting a, a, a master, it's done on a 14-inch disc. Mm. So it's a bigger disc than an LP or a 12-inch. An LP and a 12-inch are the same physical diameter 12 inches. And it has to be that. You can't, you can't make a record a bit bigger one day and a bit smaller the next all records are the same size that's the rules yeah um so um now i've lost my train of thought because my dog grabs his <laughs> if you could hear a funny noise <laughs> my dog's got um marshall we'll stop that he's got a um i'll show you now actually he's got a sprout oh very Here good it is very good yeah it, interesting i've just finished i've just finished uh, no, just finished narrating a book an audio book and um one of the characters calls his girlfriend Sprout, which is interesting. You just brought okay. it up. Okay. Um, I've got Might a, be something uh, she does. A, a, <laughs> I've got a comment here from the Blind Guy Show. It says, um, so then, should you listen back on multiple speakers and headphones to find the true sound? Good question. That is a good question, and it's a valid point if you're, um, if you're kind of not sure with what you're hearing on your existing system, and then somebody else goes to you, that sounds really bad. Mm. Or that sounds really rubbish. So yes, go and check it out. Go and check it out in the car. Go and um, go and check it out. Maybe if you can via some like TV speakers or something, where you're you're changing the formulation of what that speaker can deliver. Mm -hmm. um, check it out on headphones. Um, so that that is a that is a very valid point. But it can also it can also get you very confused because you can you can go well. It kind of sounds quite good on these speakers. Then you go somewhere else and it sounds rubbish. Yeah. And what it means in that instance normally is is your mix isn't quite right. And the one that it sounds good on might be flattering your mix a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So it is, it is useful definitely to listen on different speakers. I mean, I've heard stuff that I've worked on and I hear it in a different light. If I'm driving around in the car, you hear something come on the radio mm. and I'm like, whoa, I'm hearing bits I'd, I'd forgotten or didn't remember at the studio. But... Maybe it's because I'm listening in a slightly more relaxed way in the car than I am when I'm working on a track. And then, you know, you hear stuff come on music, music television, whatever it is, a music video comes on. And I hear stuff on a track that I've worked that sticks out more on the TV speakers, mm. particularly things like vocals and snares and whatnot. So different speakers can highlight different sounds in a different way. <clears throat> um, so... <laughs> It's really hard to find a set of speakers that you trust. And that's why I've spent 34 years with the babies that I use, because yeah. they're like my second set. Of, I don't trust anything else. No, and I've I, had I, reference monitors in. I've had NS10s and acoustic energy. You know, the NS10 is like an industry standard speaker. Sure. I can't stand it. Them. And, and in, interestingly, I've heard it said that, uh, and obviously but when you're listening to the radio, you've got to bear in mind that it's compressed to hell yeah when it comes back to you it's not how you mastered it no. or sent it sent it to the to the pressing plant sure it, it it's, it's it's like it's like this so you're not getting all of those nuances that you would get straight out of your speakers in your studio well funnily enough when i used to do a radio show um mm. and the radio station had programmed a track that i'd worked on yeah. i actually used to listen because um, we were listening off air on the desk so that you knew what was going on on the transmitter. Yes. But you could also listen off the desk. So if it was a track that I'd worked on, I could then judge what the comp what the radio station transmission compressors were doing to the audio. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's like changing the EQ, it's changing yeah. the dynamic, it's changing everything. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, you know, mind you, a lot of... Compression's good in a way because it... it 
it it makes it more dynamic for the listener but it doesn't make it more dynamic for the producer and for the artist because it's just squishing mm. that mp3 well, or, or wow it file. makes it safer for the listener let's say you yes. know and yeah. that's why radio stations did, did what they did because all records back in the day when they were playing off vinyl all records are different volumes you can't mm. help that mm. so we to even it out radio station compression came along yep and yeah basically and actually to be fair we could apply a similar sort of mixing technique to today's modern music mm -hmm. a lot of music is made like that now radio station compressors hardly have to do anything well that that leads us nicely on to the present day and and you've worked on some some really huge current pop tunes just t just tell us a little bit about some of the artists you've been working with over the past six to twelve months let's say you might have to jog my memory now because <laughs> i can only remember 30 years ago <laughs> um so okay so uh like very very recently i've been doing a lot for uh jonas blue okay um and uh alesso um and uh zed from america and calvin harris is a regular client of mine um i know i think when you came oh. down did i play you one kiss one kiss I and remember. i loved i loved that and yeah you did and you played me an instrumental version which nobody else has, he has heard so that was quite cool right because you'd stripped out all the vocals yeah. or however it works at well, your end yeah quite often what happens now when you work on a on especially on uh well even older tracks too but it's more pertinent now when you get to work on the mix um, of a of a track, often you'll get given the instrumental mix as well. Mm -hmm. You'll get you'll get given what's called the a cappella, which is just the vocals stripped stripped down. Amazing. Because what happens is, you know, let's say you get a big chart hit single, some TV stations want to use that track, but they don't want the vocals all over it because they're talking and doing voiceovers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the instrumental mix of that hit song is very useful for for example, match of the day, you know, they're quite often using banging pop tunes on there yeah. and they'll use it and commentate over the top. So yeah, we're often working on the instrumental versions and the acapella gets sent out to remixes, you know, a big track wants to get somebody to remix the tune. So they want clean vocal quality. So mm. off they get, they just get the vocals, you know, so yeah. Just looking at the back end of this, obviously 2020, we're talking about, um, I noticed one that really, I love, I love this because it's, it's one of my favorite songs originally by the Nightcrawlers. Um, oh yeah. Push, push the feeling on, which they've resampled and redone with right, uh, right on, is it, is it right on? Yeah. Right on. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, the song's called Friday. That's so it's, um, uh, the weekend, the weekend's on its way, you know, Friday, Saturday, you know that kind of thing it's, it's just, just one of those like oh. i mean yeah i did that originally back in 92 and that was a tune and yeah. even now you still to it and it doesn't sound dated um i could it just puts me straight back to 92 and i can remember what was going on um and but the thing is like um you know teenagers now will hear that track and they'll say the same thing not because of the re-release from from um uh, right on a night crawlers getting together and doing a mashup of of that tune but yeah. because they were aware of it originally and now they love it you know now that they can appreciate music themselves my son like he's he's 19 now and we've been banging music out together since he was a little toddler um and it's amazed me how much he's even appreciated stuff from before he was born <laughs> you know so i've got to show yeah. you this um I, I subscribe to a thing called chart video okay um, okay this is from promo only in in london and just looking at the tracks on your on your discography um you've <laughs> got the you've got the jonas blue something stupid and it's on it's on here <laughs> oh is it <laughs> yeah yeah it is so that's brilliant so now i know there this, you go fantastic yeah, the, the, the end result is right here and i can play it uh, at there you gigs go. and stuff and it'll have a video with it as well so that's cool right okay brilliant stuff excellent um I think that's pretty much it. I, I, if, if you've got anything for us uh, that you need us to kind of know about what's happening next, for instance. So what, what are you kind of working on in the background, if you're allowed to tell us that is? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's a bit of a contentious point half of the time. Um, okay. I, I do have to be kind of quite careful. Of course. It's not from my own point of view, but it's from it's like client confidentiality, I guess. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a, a golden rule that I never talk to anybody or play anybody anything mm -hmm. that isn't out in the public domain already. It sounds a little bit, you know, 
uh, what's no, no, no. pretentious, you know, but it, it's, 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 it's not my music. Yeah, it's professional, Mike, and, and you do the same thing. Um, you know, if 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 you were a recording engineer, recording engineer, mixing engineer, if you yeah. were in the studio with the artist, you wouldn't disclose any of that mm. until it was released. Mm-hmm. So it, it's exactly the same thing. You're looking after their interests because you don't want For their sure. competition to know that they've got a single coming out next week. <laughs> you know, that all kind of, that. of thing. All of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that classic one-liner of what goes on in the studio stays in the studio. Um, <laughs> you know, all, all comes around that, really. I mean, yeah. I'm working in isolation now anyway because of COVID and all of that, but mm. as most of us are. But even so, um, you know, music's coming through every day, new yeah. stuff's happening, and I, 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 keep it, I keep it on the down low until it's out there and, <laughs> and in the public domain, yeah. Brilliant stuff. Um, Rich Vibes says, um, prefer the original version of Nightcrawlers. So that's fine. It was a tune, wasn't it? It was yeah. an And it was an belter. instrumental originally as well. There was no vocals on it, you know that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's and then John Reed came along and they vocaled it because radio wouldn't play it back in the day because it was ah. just an instrumental. Where's the vocal they went? So they, they vocaled it up and it, then it became, you know, it had that, what's, what's the hook on the front? Na, 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 na. I'm not going to yeah. sing it. Um, no, but, no. It lies and it was again. a, they lie there you the go. People, Simple boom. hook. Yeah. There you go. Um, you just saved my life there and got me out of a deep hole. Um, well, but, you know, yeah. that was a fairly simple hook of a vocal line, but then all of a sudden, radio, you're yeah. away, you know? So, yeah, it, but top tune. It was, it, was, it was catchy because it sounds like part of it is reversed or they've edited it when, when the scene yeah. is, is happening. So yeah. it's kind of quirky Absolutely. like that. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah. And, and it does stick. Right. So when it's repetitive like that, as any dance yeah. music is, as you know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. it just, it's one of those hooks, as you say, and it's just, it just gets in your brain and you just can't get rid of it. And it's, it's, it's yeah. a long standing song. It's like, I'm thinking of like finally CC Penniston, stuff like that, that, that stays in your mind for donkey's years after it came out. All of know? that. Robin yeah. S, Show Me Love, you know, yeah. it's another one of those kind of, that, that sort of song, mm. you know. So yeah, they'll never go away. Not at all. You know. No. Yeah. Well, listen, Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on, on board with the stream for Love Audio tonight. I've enjoyed it, man. You're um, welcome. Real pleasure. Continue doing what you're doing because we love the results that come out of your studio. <laughs> and, Thank you. Uh, you yeah. know, onto, onto the marketplace. And yeah. uh, just remind everybody of where they can find it, much more about you. And that, of course, is your website, which is mikemarshmastering.co.uk. So www.mikemarshmastering.co.uk. Dot co dot uk and you'll find everything you need to That's know it. about mike on there that's fantastic right we'll leave it there thank you so much my beast hey oh i can't hear you now uh, i muted myself and not you that was weird <laughs> <laughs> thank you mike no. uh, i know God, all that the very best quick. to you thank you um what I was going to That's say right. was, if you uh, haven't yet subscribed to the channel, make sure you do so. Make sure you ting the bell as well. That will let you know of when I go live next, which is generally on a Monday night at 8 p.m. UK time, GMT. And, of course, that will change at the end of um, the month because our clocks go forward by an hour. Great. Um, spring forward, fall back. Yeah, that is correct, isn't it? Just making sure, uh, which it does, which is fantastic. If you want to look at my website, that's fine. It's uh, loveaudio.co.uk. Uh, give that a, uh, a view as well. You'll find the podcast is up there, three episodes so far. And hopefully, with Mike's permission, we can use part of today's interview as the next uh, episode of the um, the podcast at Love Audio Cafe. Um, if you want a mug like the one I'm drinking out of today, uh, then that's on the website. Uh, it's at teespring.com forward slash Love Audio Merch Store. You can see T-shirts on there as well. Mike, I'll send you one of those in the post. Um, along with a few others that I've got to order for some uh, friends abroad. So um, <laughs> I'm going to be um, gonna be out of pocket, but that's fine. No problem. And if you want to support the channel monetarily wise, you can do go to my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash love audio production and um, drop us a couple of uh, couple of quid in there. We're much appreciated if you want to. That, of course, is how you ce- celebrate the uh, the station and keep us on, on the air, as it were. Um, It's been a real pleasure with Mike Marsh as my guest this evening. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you next week. Take care, guys. All the best. Bye-bye for now.
State. Stay there, Mike.